All right, so in tachymetry system and body membranes. So this is going to be your hair, skin, and nails, um, and membranes, sense organs of the body, stuff like that. So classification of body membranes, we'll talk about these first. Epithelial is more like your, your cells and your tissues, part of your skin, and then connective tissue, all right, so we'll look at epithelial membranes, cutaneous, which is your skin, serous membrane. So an example of these are your parietal and your visceral. And I know we mentioned this, but I'll just kind of throw it back out there again. Your parietal layer is the, remember we talked about that being your flat sheet, to where your visceral is your fitted sheet that goes around the table, the table. Being that the table is the organ itself, it, the visceral contours to it. So it could be your heart, it could be your lungs, it could be your stomach, it could be like parietal peritoneum or a parietal pleura. So just layers based upon what organ you're talking about. Pleura means lung. So this this is talking about the parietal and visceral pleura. Do you remember what the stomach, heart, and lungs all have in common? They're always moving. All three of those are constantly moving in your body. So therefore, they have these layers. And in these layers, they have fluid to help reduce the friction from them constantly moving. Your stomach breaking down food and your heart beating. So uh, this one, parietal pleura and uh, visceral pleura. That's the layers around the lungs. The fluid in between those is called surfactant. So it helps keep the, the layers lubricated in there. Supposedly, and a guy told me this in, in school, that he read an article that apples help increase your surfactant. I don't know. Maybe that's why they say apple a day keeps the doctor away. No way. Saying. <laughs> so I, I've never really looked into that any further, but I mean, it kind of, like we talked about, it makes sense. So, of course, we know apple and fruits can all benefit the body. All right. Diseases, we can have inflammation of these layers too. Uh, pleurisy is a, I wouldn't say it's a common condition. It's pretty rare to the point where, I mean, I've never had a patient come in with pleurisy, but yet my brother's had pleurisy. Runners get it from like running out in the cold. It's just like chest pain because these layers get inflamed. So it's just like every time they breathe, it like hurts. It could be caused from an infection, uh, anything. If somebody is having chronic pleurisy, lung issues, it could be related to like an autoimmune disorder, like rheumatoid arthritis or something like that. So my brother get about every once every two, three years. I, I don't really suspect him to having anything as far as that goes. But somebody gets this two or three times a year. Yeah, you'd want to, you know, I don't know how how far you want to co-care but you know something uh if you refer one patient out and the doctor's like oh yeah you know they were right your credibility shoots straight up so it's like it's and and then the patient's respect and, and all that so like i've always said you don't have to know all of this you just have to know what is not right so and who to send it to because if you send them to their GP and then their GP send them to the pulmonologist, it's got like, oh, the GP found it. And, you know, but <clears throat> hey, I guess as long as the patient gets scared, it doesn't matter. Peritonitis. Have you heard of that term before? Okay, peritonitis we can get from appendicitis. When your appendix ruptures, all the toxins in the appendix can go all over the peritoneum. And it's peritonitis that kills you, not the rupture of the appendix. 
So about 24 hours of peritonitis and yeah. So that's why it's so sudden if it ruptures that they got to you know, get you in surgery, try to get some of this infection and, and pathogens and stuff out of your peritoneum so it's not spreading around. All right, so just kind of looking at some of those layers here. Uh, we, we see their outlines around the organs and different cavities and stuff. The knee or the joints, I should say, have connective tissue. So these are going to be synovial membranes. And inside of those are going to be synovial fluid to help keep the joints and stuff lubricated. So the bones are a little bit different than the organs, but the concept's still kind of the same as far as like, let's keep, as long as it's a moving mark, we need to keep it lubricated in there. All right, mucous membranes. Mucous membranes are important because they help keep any opening to the external surface um, clean, moist, so we don't get pathogens and and um, other bacteria stuff like that into our to the openings to the body. So it's per, for prevention and lubrication of the openings. So the connective tissue do not contain epithelial components. Produce a lubricant called synovial fluid. Kind of mentioned that. Examples are the synovial membranes and the spaces between the joints and in the linings of the bursal sacs. So we have these bursa sacs in those joints that you probably heard of bursitis. So inflammation of the bursa sac. All right. Uh, the skin. So this is going to be the first appendage of the tegumentary system. So we have different layers to our skin here. The top layer, epi or epidermis. We know epi means on top or upon. So upon the dermis. So it's going to be epidermis, dermis, and then subdermis, sub underneath the dermis. But really, we just talk about these two primary layers of the epithelium or epidermis. It's the outer layer and thinnest primary layer of skin composed of several layers of stratified squamous so more than one layer squamous cells stratum germitinevum innermost layer that continually um, reproduces so this is the layer when our skin flakes off it's the one that's going to regenerate new so your body pretty well turns over every cell in you every seven years so every seven years, you're a new you. But we know our skin's a whole lot faster than that. There's quite a few layers of the skin that I'm sure the aesthetic students could come in and tell us every one of them. Not important for us, but for them, it's really important. You know, they're they're like, why do we need to know those muscles? Y'all don't. Y'all just deal with the skin. You know, leave the muscles to us. So um, don't get so wrapped up. And I don't think your book really goes into a lot of them either. I want to think there's like 11 different layers. Stratum germitinevum, stratum corneum. Like there's, there's all kinds. So as cells approach the surface, they're filled with a waterproof protein called keratin. So this is what gives us the waterproofing of our skin. Because we know we could sit in a bathtub or a swimming pool, the ocean, whatever it is, uh, for a long period of time before our cells start kind of expanding and you get the wrinkled feeling. But if it wasn't for this protein, it would happen a whole lot faster. So it's the protein. And then, so you lift your arm out and you have like little beads, like your freshly waxed car or something. So that's the... The protein. So these little things like that that you're going to want to know. I try to go through and underline the majority of them. 
that's this will be important for you. So keratin, waterproof protein of the skin. So stratum corneum outer layer of the keratin filled cells. The pigment layer, pigment containing layer, this is in, in epidermis, layer that contains the pigment cells called melanocytes, which produce the brown pigment called melanin. So as the UV rays come through, it stimulates the melanocytes. Melanocytes is what creates the darker skin. So if you had a bunch of these together, it could be like a freckle. Um, and what would be like you think the main reason for that? Like, again, we mentioned that unique design. Like, I'd have never thought about that. As our skin gets darker, what's it do to the sun? I mean, what is it? What is its relationship to the sun? As our skin is darker. It's like a UV I mean, protection. Yeah. So it naturally is protecting itself. So that's what the, the pigment does. It helps protect the skin from the UV rays. So blisters, they're a breakdown of these uh, squamous cells or really any cells. You ever had a blister before? I'm sure most people have. From like a burn? Oh, ooh, I hated those. <laughs> I'd always I stick that know. little cushion in there and it never helped. And Yeah. I was big, big, like, not to wear socks growing up. Like, I hated wearing socks. And then leather shoe, dress shoe, whatever it is. So, but yeah. All right, so that's probably the most important in the epithelial region for or epidermis. We're going to kind of look at the dermis. And I, let me show you a picture of this before I get into that. So top layer here, epidermis. This is the dermis. And then the yellow part down here being the subdermis. So all these are over here. So when I look at this, though, I think of like an egg crate. You know what those are? I, I remember those used to be big when they first came out. My mom was like, yeah, we need these on every bed in the house and you'll sleep so much better. And so that's that's kind of what I think about when I see the skin. However, that egg crate is very important and will We'll see what the dermal papillae does here in a second. So this is, you see a lot of the layers in here. And then you look at this area, you're like, that's pretty busy. Like there's a lot going on, receptors. And then down at the bottom, we see a lot of uh, blood vessels. And then the good old yellow stuff in here, which is the stored energy, right? or fat cells. So you ever had a paper cut did not bleed? Yeah. Okay. So most of the time. So when we look at this, do you see any blood vessels in the epidermis? Uh -uh. They all start in the dermis. So that means when you cut your finger, you didn't cut down to the dermis. You just cut the epidermis layer. All right. So there's your epidermis. So now let's kind of flip back and look at the dermis. Deeper and thicker of the two layers, and composed largely of connective tissue. Upper area of the dermis characterized by parallel rows of peg-like dermal papillae. So the ridges and grooves in the dermis papillae form patterns unique to each individual. So those dermal papillae create our fingerprints. So as the skin's tight over that area, it contours to the dermal papillae, and that's what creates a fingerprint. 
It's like, huh? All right. Um, and these grooves are important for like gripping. So deeper areas of the dermis filled with network of collagenous stretchable elastic fibers. Numerous elastic fibers. So basically it's saying if you're going to use an anti-wrinkle cream, do it before you get wrinkles because then it's a little too late. I know my mom, bless her heart, she puts that stuff on. I'm thinking that is a lot of money that you're wasting, but I don't have the heart to tell her. Just let her do it. I mean, if it, if it helps, but definitely anti-wrinkle cream before the wrinkles start for sure. So the dermis also contains nerve endings. So we're going to see a lot of the organ cells here. So hair follicles, sweat glands, oil glands, and we mentioned the blood vessels already. All right, so now we're looking at this thicker layer. Pink. Right? That pink, that layer. Okay. What kind of jumps out at you in that layer? Like when you look at it, is like all the blood vessels or the hair, this thing, that thing. Yeah, because it's not like going in the direction of everything else, I guess. It kind of throws our eyes off. So a little free marketing tip is when you create your business card or a sign or something don't make it symmetrical put it off because our eyes go to something that's non-symmetrical tilted more than it goes to something that's symmetrical yeah i had to pay for that but that's free for you <laughs> oh the stuff we learn over the years all right so let's just kind of look at some of these we talked about the blood vessels already we could look at the hair. So if it's outside of the skin, this is going to be the hair shaft. So is our hair like dead cells? Have you heard that? Like your hair is all dead cells. Why are you spend so much money on shampoo? Really? Well, you can go tell everybody it is. <laughs> because really, it, the only part that's living is going to be in the skin so as it pushes out it's constantly dying off and you know your hair splits breaks stuff like that so the further it grows the less collagen elastic fibers and textile strength that it keeps that's why it starts breaking like it does it just gets unhealthy so hair shaft on the outside hair follicle here And then we trace it on back, the hair papillae. So the thing is the papillae is like the hair seed. So the hair is going to grow from that papillae. So hair papillae, follicle, shaft. All right. So getting to this little muscle here, let's talk about this little gland first. So it says sebaceous oil glands. So if we kind of think about it, if we go three or four days and not wash our hair, our skin, it gets pretty oily, right? Some people a little bit more oily than others. And that's because of the sebaceous gland in here. The sebaceous gland, like I said, it secretes oil. And that's what helps keep your hair healthy, oily, shiny, all that good stuff. Comes out onto your skin. So that it's a good thing that we have this. Otherwise, it would be very brittle and it would break off a whole lot easier than what it does. So sebaceous gland secretes oil for the hair. Now, this little muscle, this is your erector pillae. So you may see it with an E or an A erector pillae. This is what causes your hair to stand up. 
So when you get scared or something, this is a pet or sympathetic controlled autonomic and it contracts and pulls on the hair and makes the hair stand up. So how many hairs actually stand up on your arm when you get scared? A lot, right? So we have an erector pillae to every muscle or every hair in our body. That is a small muscle. But believe it or not, that's not the smallest muscle in the body. I know. It's the smallest muscle in your body is in your ear. So we'll talk about that special senses. But that's that's still pretty small. All right, so that's going to contract and then cause the, the hair to, to raise, give us goosebumps. All right, so if we keep kind of working around, well, let's stay on this one because we have a couple sense organs here we could look at. The first one is going to be the Meissner's corpuscle. Corpuscle means it's it's encapsulated. So it's going to have a capsule around it versus free nerve endings. And I want to think they're listed on here somewhere. All right. Uh, this would be like a free nerve ending, how it comes up and just kind of branches off. Mm -hmm. But they don't really have it. There's part of one looks like it goes up. All right, but the free nerve endings are for um, like nerve pain sensation, stuff like that. But these are going to detect different types of sensations. So Meissner's corpuscle and then the Pacinian corpuscle down here. What do you think they got their names? Like anything else, the person who founded them. Got to name them. So, all right. If I was, what's that? Yeah. So, if I was to ask you which out of those two corpuscles, which one detects deep pressure? Probably What about light touch? The okay, good, because I want you to kind of see that concept. Like, if I barely touch the skin, you're stimulating the Meissner's corpuscle. Yeah. You're not pushing deep far enough to, to get the yeah, the corpuscle or the Pacinian. So just kind of keep that in mind. And when you're studying, too, hopefully it'll help you reduce a little bit of the time. Just by knowing the location, it makes sense on what they do. All right. Um, okay, let's cover this sweat gland here. Uh, talked about the hair follicle being underneath the skin. The hair shaft is on the outside. The hair papillae is where it grows from. Erector pillae gives contracts, which causes the straightening of the hair, gives the goosebumps. All right, so receptors, we mentioned the Meissner's, Pacinian, the free nerve endings, and then there's there's a bunch of organ senses is what they're called, receptors in, in the skin, but these probably some of the most popular. So uh, Krauss's nerve endings detect heat. So when you lay heat on your skin, you can, it's your Krauss's that's going to detect that. Uh, did we talk about the alpha and pain fibers? How, so like pain fibers, when they travel in their body, the stimulation travels really slow. So if you will get some type of heat or cold or vibration, that sensation overpowers your pain fibers 
and that will take away some of the pain. So that's why when we ice something, it not only reduces the swelling, but it also takes the pain away because it overrides those C fibers, which are our pain fibers. For example, when you shut your finger up in a car door, hit it with a hammer, what do you do? Okay, after you cuss, you go, ow, you shake it because you're causing vibration in there for it to move around. Your body's trying to eliminate that pain already, or you'll grab it and you'll squeeze it, override that pain. We naturally do that sensation, but we just don't know why we do it. All right. Uh, nails. Don't ask me why this picture's in here because it has nothing to do with nails. That is my hand. I don't know why. I think this picture is supposed to be on this slide back here when we talked about the water mm -hmm. beating up because it looks like there's I have my hand in water because of the beating up I don't know I, I guess I should delete it but makes for good explanation and example you know that's real life stuff there all right nails our nails are quite unique and to the point where there's more to our nails than what we actually know and more than what's every time you go to the doctor they're probably looking at your nails and you didn't it's not because you're manicure either because your nails can tell a lot about your internal insides and we're not just talking about the spots on your nails either. We'll get there. All right. So produced by epithelial, let's see, uh, fingers and toes, visual parts called the nail body, Ooh, the cuticle. Do you get manicures done? Do you? If they wouldn't like push on my cuticle, I'd probably get more done, but I can't stand that. Casey taught me into getting a pedicure one night. He's like, yeah, just go get a pedicure. You know, no big deal. He knows I don't like my feet, like, touched oh, or worked yeah. on. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it because I've never done it. We were testing that night or something, so we didn't have anything else to do. I was good. I hate cutting my toenails, too. So I was like, yeah, she cut my toenails, you know, like, she's doing it right. And when she got to that thing, when she scrubs the bottom of your foot, mm -hmm. I came out of that chair like that ruined the whole thing for me. I've not been back since like that was awful. I could not. She's like, I don't know. She done it too hard or I didn't know what to expect. Probably, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, you might as well just pull my nails out because you're pretty well same pain right there. But I got those cool flip-flops afterwards. I was happy about that. <laughs> All right. The crescent. So, Lanula here. The moon-shaped crescent. And, gosh, I can't remember. We were discussing this in one class, and we came up with some type of theory. Do you see the Lanula on your fingers? Oh, yeah, I can't remember what we were talking about, but I mean, I barely see mine, but it, I don't remember if it's like the younger we are, the more prominent they are. Don't quote me on that, but I don't. There was something unique about the Lanula, like we come to conclude in that class. It was it was interesting though. But we know as the nail grows, it pushes out and keeping the free nerve ending clipped. Um, let's go back to this. One. Okay. Oh yeah, your nail bed. So if you've ever been to the doctor and they like squeeze the end of your finger, 
Oh, you probably have done that, haven't you? Gosh, I always, I don't, I forget about that. I just let it flow. Huh? I just let it flow. Yeah. Okay. Good. Just, just let me get it out that way, because it's part of my routine. Yeah. <laughs> Because if, if, if you don't let me say it in the sections, kind of like, there goes the whole thing. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm off track and yeah. But um, for everybody else, you can check your oxygen level by pushing. It's called blanching your nail and the capillary refill is what you're looking for. So the color going back to pink instead of the white. All right, so we know our our finger doesn't look like that. Like we don't have that much adipose tissue. Plus, we got all these tendons and connective tissue. So they removed all that just to kind of show us the the nail itself. Isn't it the weirdest feeling? Like if your nail's ripped off, like underneath it, I can't I can't stand that either. That's, and I know. <laughs> My brother had his big toe removed, and I'm like, how do you wear socks? Like, I would be like done the for the whole toenail because he would get oh, infected so toenails, so they oh. took the whole toenail off. I mean, he was, we were probably, he was in high school, and I just remember him just, like, ripping his toenail off, and he kept growing back and getting infected and stuff, and he finally went to the podiatrist, and they they took it off. I don't think it ever grew back but like every pair of socks in my drawer would have a cutout for that big toe <laughs> like it would not be touching anything so i guess the sensation kind of changes over the years oh I, I need to ask him about that all right so i mentioned your nails what they can tell someone and here's a few. So if we see clubbing of the nails, how it rounds off, that could lead to COPD, which we know chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It could be arthritis. The transitions or the uh, transverse lines. And we're not talking one or two nails here. We're talking every nail on your hand or every nail on your foot has that deep transition in it not this way because those ridges are pretty normal it's this way and we can also get these if we were to damage say we did hit our finger with the hammer or something it can grow out like that because i've had that happen before like your nail go black and mm -hmm. it eventually grow out but that's going to be one maybe two nails the whole thing so those are just some some things like your your doctor when they grab your hand, um, they're they're checking, they're looking at just to just kind of FYI. All right, a couple others splintered. So at the tips, kind of splinters out. Some type of heart condition. This is like a uh, autoimmune disease. SBE, and then the pitted nails, joint disease, um, cirrhosis, not cirrhosis, but psoriasis. There's a kind of little, you know what psoriasis is versus eczema? Have you heard of those two? Or no. So way to keep those separate is... And it's Christmas time, so it kind of goes. The, the jingle goes, uh, pitted nails, wait, silver scales, pitted nails on your extensors. That's uh, ex or psoriasis. So silver scales being the scab on the skin, the pitted nails, which looks like this, and... Um, psoriasis is always on the extensors, if you noticed. The back of the arm, the top of the knee, the back of the neck, all those are extensor muscles. So kind of 
keep that in mind when you're trying to differentiate between the two. Is this eczema? Is this some type of dermatitis or, you know, or this? So, yeah. When we were doing uh, our boards, part four boards, it was a clinical. So they were set up to, it's, it's kind of like our rooms here, but there was a patient inside the room and there was a kind of a person who graded. On the outside of the room where the files are, there was a case out there. So we had to read the case and then go in and perform either tests that they had told us related to that case. And we had to tell them the disease or diagnosis when we were done. And we only had like 20 minutes per room, but this lasted for four hours. So that test was four hours long. You couldn't take a break either. We had Jolly Ranchers in our pockets for like food. Oh my God. It was, it was crazy. But one lady had her nails painted blue and it was related to her case on the outside. So if you didn't know to recognize the nails, then you would have missed that part. So, I mean, those, they get like very uh, detailed up there because <laughs> they, I mean, it's, it, it was crazy. Some of the stuff, like you had to set up certain adjustments and all that, but. All right, so the skin. We talked about the skin earlier, but we need to talk about some of those glands, the oil glands and the sweat glands. Sweat glands good? Do we want sweat glands? Yeah, we, we want the good sweat glands. So we got two different types. We have sweat or sudoriferous, and then we have sebaceous glands. So we'll figure out the difference between the two. So the first one, sweat or sudoriferous glands, we have two different types, eccrine and apocrine. And what these do, the eccrine is, like it says, the most numerous, important, and widespread of the sweat glands. This helps produce fluid or the uh, sweat on the outside of the skin that beads up which allows the body to cool off when you say exercise or get too hot conduction, convection, radiation, all that stuff. So the eccrine glands are good. This is what we wipe off our head or have on our arm or whatever. So definitely, we definitely want the eccrine glands, the apocrine glands. These are no bueno. So this is the sweat glands that produce the thicker mucus type of fluid. So we don't, this is not the good, good stuff, but it's, it's not so bad. It's only when it mixes with the bacteria on our skin. Cause we talked about the normal floor on your skin and the bacteria, like there's stuff all over, all over us around us right now, but our body's containing this stuff. But when this, uh, Apricot sweat comes out and mixes with the bacteria, and that's what creates the odor. So we know some people have a little more apocrine secretion than others, or a little more bacteria on their skin than what we like to um, smell. Of course, we talked about how to trick patients into taking a bath. So this might be another situation to where you have them have them do that. So definitely do what you need to hear because uh, you can wipe the eccrine sweat off, but you can't wipe this off. Like, <laughs> raise your arm. Let me wipe that off. Um, really, you're not going to be really working on a lot of these areas where the apocrine glands are the most prominent so it's it's not a matter of getting away from this. It's how you go to prevent somebody coming in, but it's a natural process. Just help keep them educated on what's going on. So really, it's not the sweat; it's the bacteria that 
they need to be working on. All right, so a way to keep these separate, eccrine glands are good, apocrine glands are not good. They make you smell like an ape, not good. So think of the apocrine glands, the thicker, smelly type of um, secretion. And then the one we mentioned a minute ago, sebaceous, nature skin cream. So this is the sebum that comes out of our, of our cells, but it can mix with the bacteria on our skin, get backed up into the ducts, and that creates the blackheads. Um, like we mentioned, this is, this is good to have because it helps keep our skin lubricated and hair lubricated. We want some of this, but not, not an overproduction of it. We want to control it. I know the, the developer of chiropractic, there was a founder, which is Dee Dee Palmer. His son, BJ Palmer, helped develop it. He was such a naturalist, like he wouldn't take baths because he was scared of the chemicals and the shampoo would get inside his body and, you know, affect his healing and stuff like that. So he had long, shiny, greasy hair, like, I don't know. It's supposedly he killed an elephant one time trying to adjust it with a two by four because they were big in Barnum and Bailey Circus. And every time it would come to town, they would always adjust the animals. I don't know how true that is, but in their house, they had a bunch of Barnum and Bailey stuff because you could do mansion tours and stuff. Yeah. Because that campus is, it's uh, surrounded their house. So their house is like dead center of the campus. So it's, it's kind of sweet how it's all set up like around them. But Ronald Reagan, they own a radio station. That's where Ronald Reagan first got on the radio is for the Palmers in Iowa, Davenport, Iowa. So he, um, I like to see how involved that he was in chiropractic. That'd be interesting. I heard, and I've actually tried it, like oil from our skin, the side of your nose. And seriously, I was this desperate in Iowa. Use it for a chapstick. Because it's it's just oil. And I don't know if you've ever been in the Midwest in winters. Whew. Not good. Like, my lips would always bleed. My hands were bleeding. Just because the wind is constantly blowing. It's so cold. And, yeah. You would have liked it there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I came here and I was like... Finally, warm weather. I was one of those wearing shorts for about two, three years after I moved here in the winter. I was like, it is so warm here. Yeah. But now I'm like, no, nah, get my jacket. But yeah, it was, I mean, eight inches of snow there. They're going to school. Right. I was like, are we, we got school today? And yeah, we're going. Like, and I lived just that distance far enough to, Probably here to Taco Bell. This far enough to not drive, but yet too far to really walk in the cold. But uh, walked it every day. It was it was fun, I guess. All right. So the functions of the skin. We have some functions here that we need to make sure we get these down. There's three big ones that we want to make sure we know because this question kind of sounds like which of the following is not a function of the skin. So we know protection, the first line of de defense against any type of microbes, the sun, chemicals. Do you know what Imbolex, not Imbolex, but uh, MCAP is the kind of like your boards, but it's an interest exam for the medical students that they got to take it before they get into medical school. Mm -hmm. I was just flipping through it one day and I seen a question there what's the first line of defense against the microbes? And it was the skin. Like that was a question in medical book. So temperature regulation. We know we sweat through our skin, 
which is a good thing. Those eccrine sweat glands are really working to produce that uh, sweat to cool off our body temperature. So temperature regulation. And sense organ activity. This is the, the pressure, the pain, the temperature, all those sensations on the body that can alert us to a, a problem or danger or pleasure, whatever it is. Okay, so organ sensation, temperature regulation, and protection. Three functions of the skin. Burns. Because your background is in the medical field. Uh, have you seen like a lot of burns come in? Yeah, I mean, it usually it's... They go to a specialist. Burns are really a crazy thing to the point where it, it really affects a lot of the individual. I'll tell you a story. There was a... It was the second or third massage therapy class. <clears throat> and I still know who she is. I talked to her after she graduated. We ended up like working in the same building. I had my office. She had a massage room. And she was like one of these bubbly girls and everything. And when I got to this section, she got really quiet to the point where it's like, hmm, you know, it's a red flag for me. So the more I covered, the more she kind of came out and, and told us because we had 10 weeks of anatomy. This is before they got in the skills class. So 10 weeks of anatomy, 10 weeks of skills, and every 10 weeks we would rotate then. So she ended up telling us her story, and then she was probably 20, 21, so it yeah, pretty recent. She when she was 16, she was working at Fazoli's. So somebody told her to check the water that was boiling in the pot and they didn't put up the splash card. So I don't know how it happened, but she said when she looked, it like dumped out on her, tilted on her, and it hit her from like the waist down. And it just completely burned her. She said, last thing I remember, I was running to the bathroom, just pulling my clothes off. And then uh, she had severe burns. She was in the hospital. And this happened when she was 16. So imagine not just the superficial part, but mentally, you got a 16-year-old that doesn't feel comfortable in a bathing suit or shorts or anything now. She's going to need some psychological therapy. So that's... That's what I'm saying. Burns are more than just superficial scars. They can really damage someone forever. So it's, we know when we do get burnt, the tissue doesn't heal back like it normally would. So it would affect the massage or anything else, the sensation of it. So you have to treat that a little bit different than you would normal tissue. And they're probably not going to even think about it when you're there. Like when they come in, they're not with, oh, I burned my elbow or something, you know, until you start working on it and you start feeling that tissue change. And then you might ask them about it. But I think it's more so that they're over it, that they've learned to kind of get through it and put it behind them to the point where they don't even really. Yeah, think about it or share it with people until you bring it up to them. So, um, you know, that's, that's going to be kind of touchy, still a touchy subject for some. So just kind of think about that and read up on the best way that you should handle it for your profession. And that way, if you're ever encountered. All right. So we know burns, when we hear burn victim, it's oh, they were 18% burnt or 34% burnt or whatever. You know, they always give us a number of percentage of burnt of the body. So this is how they come up with those numbers. So the body's divided into 11 areas, 9% each. So this is what it looks like. 
So let's just use that case that I was telling you about. If she was burnt from, say, the waist down, we've got 1%, we've got 9%, we've got 9%. So technically of her body, 18, 19% of her body was burnt. So if it got up here a little bit, that would throw some of those percentages in there. So maybe 20, 21% of her body. What if it burnt front and back side of the both legs? Yeah, so one leg is 18% front and back. The other one, 18 is 36 and then 37. So she would have a 37% burn all over her body. So that's where they're coming in 11 regions of the body and then the 9%. So four and a half, four and a half, everything's broken up into nine except for the, the one percent. All right, so different classes of burns. This this is gonna wrap us up. So we have actually how many classes do you think we have? Classification or degrees of burns do you think we have? Three or four, right? Correct. Yep. So we have four. Okay. Understand. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't say like seven. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that means. Yeah, good. All right. So you got the question right on the test. That'd been good. Um, first degree, it's kind of just epidermis. Say we know we've touched a dish or we were out in the sun a little too long. We're a little sensitive in that area. So we just kind of irritated the epidermis layer. The second degree is going to be the blistering layer. So this one involves the dermis. So if you end up getting blisters, now you affected the dermis. So a little bit deeper in there. Third degree, a little bit deeper, affecting the underlying on the muscle. So this is when we have, or we can really have issues with the blisters, but with the second degree, but mostly the third degree. And they really say that the third degree is painless. Or you don't even have, don't even give them pain. Does that make sense on why? I guess, yeah, because I mean, the heat probably damaged the- It burns the nerves yeah. until it starts to regenerate, grow back that's when they start having the pain. So um, that's one big issue, the pain with it. Also the feeling or the sensation in the area, they really can't feel it and the infection can build up because we don't have the normal floor on our skin anymore. So we got to watch out for that infection to build up. And then I don't have the fourth degree listed, but a fourth degree would be like burning completely through the bone, like skin, muscle, bone, everything, which that one is, is pretty rare. I, I don't think I've ever seen that. I don't think I've ever seen a third degree. I've had a second, but not, not a third. You ever, have you ever known anybody? Yeah. All right. Well, that's it.